Hi, good afternoon. I'm actually going to let some folks get into this room and before we officially get launched, but I'm so excited to have Mitsuko here today. <laughs> So, so well, as you all get into the room, um, I'm Gigi Davis. I'm the Job and Internship Coordinator with Piedmont Virginia Community College. And um, uh, I we decided to do this career chat series because there's just so many wonderful people in the community, like Mitsuko, who um, are, have been in town and around uh, supporting students and young professionals and not so young professionals uh, <laughs> get their foothold um, in the, the world of education. Actually, she helped in other ways and I'm gonna let her talk about her career journey in just a, a second, but I was fortunate to get to work with Misako. One of those years, I, when I did the math the other day, I was like, oh, yes. oh that was- It was 1999. I don't, and luckily math is not my thing. So I'm not, but that was way back at the University of Virginia Career Services office. Um, and then our our lives transitioned, both of our lives transitioned so that I ended up over at the Curry School of Education, the education school um, as a director of education career services. So I got to keep working with Mitsuko because she was one of my very favorite go-to recruiters um, with Albemarle County Public Schools. Um, and then, of course, I had another life transition <laughs> and headed elsewhere, but our paths continue to cross at Bodo's because our boys all love Bodo's. There you go. So that's where when we decided to do feature education as our career um, because of it, PVCC does have um, a, a lot of pre-education students and we of course have the early childhood development program as well, um, which fortunately the governor is supporting with the G3 grant and hopefully getting more uh, students to pursue early childhood education since it's such a needed area. So, so that's where I was like, me to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> so me to go, I'll let you take it away and share a little bit about your career journey with us before I ask you some questions. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Gigi, for um, the opportunity and to everyone who's out there um, watching and listening. Thank you so much for um, inviting me into your spaces and your homes and school or wherever you are, your car maybe even. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, I am Mitsuko Clemens-Nazir, as Gigi already shared with you. Um, I have been in the Charlottesville community since 1999 when I first met Gigi. And um, I'd love to share my career journey with you um, before we get in. So feel free to um, jump right in there with questions for those of you who are participating and utilize the chat feature uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And I'd be happy to address anything that um, you would need to. I very much like um, creating positions and presenting to individuals who are in the spaces and I can't physically see you. So um, just jump right in there, okay? And I'd be happy to address any questions. And if I, if I can't, I'd be happy to follow up with you as, as well. Uh, my career journey is as follows, a little history, a um, little background, and I promise I won't go too far back, but um, personality-wise, I, um, what, First of all, I'd like to present to you who I am holistically, okay? So there's going to be some focus on the career piece, but then also who I am and what character I, I bring to the table, because I think that's important as you are looking at who you are and matching yourselves up with careers and professions. Um, these are some of the factors that might, you know, you might wanna consider. So I've always been a pretty carefree, um, enthusiastic leader, I would call myself. Um, I very much love working. I've always loved working. It, it was like a hobby. Um, but there are three consistent interests that I've had in my life. Um, one was loving on my family. I'm one of nine children and uh, one of 54 first cousins. And so my cousins were always my friends and family was always important to me. Uh, the second thing that I was very much interested in is dancing. Um, I'm a classically trained dancer and um, have always just appreciated the arts. 
And the third thing was serving others through leadership, in particular through social justice um, issues. Throughout my K-12 and college experiences, I held student government positions, always, you know, again, leadership roles. Um, my Growing up, my parents encouraged me and my siblings to study one art form, one world language, and you had to do one type of activity. So we chose, uh, most of us chose a sport um, and I ended up um, running, I was a sprinter and also playing soccer. Um, I wouldn't call myself playing soccer, but I'm very knowledgeable of soccer, but I would not call myself playing soccer. I run very fast. Um, at any rate, so um, I started dancing when I was five and in my teenage years, I grew pretty serious about the art of movement and dance. Um, my mother really put me in dance because uh, she wanted to soften me up a little bit and make me less rugged, I guess, bring kind of like a balance. And then also just an acknowledgement that um, health was really important and she very, very much valued that. And I, I tended to move around a lot um, and I couldn't sit in my seat. So um, she put me in dance to kind of give me some discipline. But um, again, I grew pretty serious about dance and I even attended a performing arts high school um, in Virginia Beach or in the, the Tidewater area. I am originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, so through those experiences I um, and those interests, I thought that maybe I wanted to dance professionally. Um, but back in the day, in the late 80s when I was trying to figure this part out, uh, my body started to biologically form in shapes and places that a classically trained dancer might not necessarily fit in, as well as, uh, believe it or not, there were there wasn't a lot of casting interracially um, for dance companies and such. And so challenges came, it mattered not. I did end up choosing not to pursue dancing as a profession, but I did continue to do so. Um, and was a co-founder of a dance company at my alma mater, my first alma mater, which I can go into a little bit later about. But at any rate, um, so my, my family was very much supportive of this dance interest, but they also very much valued education. And so I ended up um, at the age of 17, leaving Virginia Beach um, and off to Blacksburg, Virginia, um, home of Virginia Tech. I am a happy hokey. And I ended up um, pulling from my uh, interests um, to decide on a major. And um, by the time I was in high school, I did, um, I was exposed to five different languages, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. And so that kind of stuck with me. Um, um, and so I ended up majoring in international studies with a concentration in Japanese communications because I thought that I wanted to be a, a TV broadcaster or a journalist. I um, don't remember having a choice not to attend college. Um, it was just a matter of where. And so that's what I did. Um, while at Virginia Tech, I definitely took advantage of the experiences and um, I've, like I said, I've, working was always a hobby. And so I just continued to find jobs and, and work and volunteer in places. And I found myself in a lot of the different student affairs offices that, um, that Virginia Tech had, things like the Dean of Students Office or um, Office for International Student Services, uh, admissions. I was a tour guide for Virginia Tech and I also worked in financial aid. So that just kind of kept me going and kept me busy. It did end up solidifying um, another interest in education and working with adults. Um, I ended up taking my first communications class and the communications class did not like me. We did not like one another. So <laughs> I figure, you know, that's okay. I still have other interests. Um, and so, I just continued with that, not really thinking that a major was going to um, determine what I was going to ultimately do in life, okay? And so um, what ended up happening is I, again, started to realize that there wasn't a specific major or, 
or anything um, because the careers that I was most interested in, they didn't require licenses or certifications or anything. So I really kept myself open. Um, I say that now, but I think deep down inside, I probably just had uh, what is, I guess, known as ADD. <laughs> I had it back then, but I just, I just didn't know. I had multiple interests. And like I said, I was always everywhere. But at any rate, uh, five major changes and five years later, I ended up graduating from Virginia Tech with a degree, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Arts and Sciences, because I was able to choose a major that took in all of those credits and all of those experiences and really allowed it to formalize who I was or who I wanted to be. So my minors are actually in English education, Black studies, and um, and English literature concentration. Um, and so that's what I graduated with. Um, upon graduation, I decided that I was, I needed a little help career-wise. And so I went to a place called Career Services Center. Ooh, Career Services Center, where Gigi actually works. Um, and I was advised by a gentleman by the name of Ernie Andrews, um, who is no longer with us, but he said, you know, looking at your resume, have you ever thought about going in student affairs? And in particular, maybe career services is what you want to do. You know, like I said, I've always enjoyed working and I actually found joy in studying how people work and what they do um, and what work environments are like. And so um, I applied to the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Delaware for graduate school and ended up majoring in college counseling and student affairs practice in higher education. I chose Delaware because um, it provided me with a graduate assistantship and, um, and a stipend, a living stipend to mm -hmm. pay for that. That's and so um, I guess what I'm trying to say you guys is that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to embed in kind of like strategies that you can actually use as you are progressing in your own career journeys as well. So I got my graduate um, education paid for and, um, and three years later with the graduate assistantship and uh, interning in the School of Business and also in the Counseling Center, I served as a faculty advisor to the LGB uh, student group which is what back then it was called LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual student group, um, student union. Now there's a number of different um, populations that we're serving and that are encompassing in that group. I also served as a faculty advisor to the black uh, student union as well. So um, I had a wealth of experience. It was, it was a great learning experience. Um, I was in Delaware, like I said, and that was a bit cold. I'm originally from Virginia <laughs> Beach. So I decided when I graduated to not apply for any job opportunities in any cold places. So I applied to islands and I applied to places like the University of Florida, which I then found myself there serving as the assistant director for career development at the University of Florida. Um, I paid particular focus um, and accountability to the College of Arts and Sciences. I really enjoyed working with people who were undecided and not really knowing what they wanted to be when they grew up. Um, I worked with the athletic director, uh, excuse me, athletic department. Um, and then also I taught career development classes. Um, in the athletic department, I was actually known as the dream killer because I was responsible for providing counseling services to student athletes who unfortunately either were injured or for whatever reason, um, you know, they weren't recruited um, and they chose not to, or they, there wasn't a choice to pursue their athletics um, professionally. So uh, that's what I did. Um, I did that for two years and I ended up moving to Charlottesville to be with my now husband who was at graduate school in graduate school at the University of Virginia. And I became a counselor, a career counselor at UVA's career services, uh, university career services. And that's where I actually met Gigi. Um, and- You got lucky to get her. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, taught career development classes and had loads of fun. Again, building my learning and capacity around career development issues. 
and practices. Um, I stayed there for eight months and was recruited by Albemarle County Schools um, to serve as a recruitment and staffing coordinator. One of the reasons why I decided to leave higher ed, because this was actually my first choice to step outside of the box and do something different and not within my major, um, was because I found myself advising students on how to work and how to find jobs and all of those things, but I myself had never really done that before. Um, I was still young, I had, wasn't even 30. Then um, I wasn't even, I was in my late, mid to late 20s, I think it was. Um, and I decided to go get some work experience so I could eventually return back into higher ed to be a better advisor. Well, 18 years later, <laughs> served in a number of different leadership roles in the Human Resources Department for Albemarle County um, Schools and Local Government Human Resources Department. I um, had, you know, like I said, lots of fun, 18 years. Um, I ended up giving birth in 2001 to a son and another in 2005. Um, awesome times, again, awesome learning experiences and um, came over to Charlottesville City Schools two years ago to serve as their assistant director for um, human resources. Still staying in human resources work, um, but now um, specifically brought to um, continue to create safe learning spaces and safe workspaces, professional workspaces for adults and also um, equitable opportunities in the workplace. And so that's what I'm doing now. My future goals entail going back to school and continuing to serve people um, in the capacity that I haven't quite figured out yet, but I am still learning what I wanna be when I grow up. It's, that, it's so great to hear. I don't know if I've ever heard your total story because that's where I was like, nine kids? It's funny because I was like, I was one of six. And so then I'm like, and then the dance, my brother wanted me to do dance and I, that dance class at VCU. So I, <laughs> and I, I was, thought about VCU too. <laughs> and it was funny because I was like, this is my twin sister of a different mother. <laughs> yeah, definitely had similar journeys, but uh, yeah. Well, and it's funny because like you loaded up your education at the beginning, whereas I didn't get my education till I, you know, finished my education till I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. But I spent a lot of time in my 20s, you know, in different industries and different environments from government to retail to restaurant management to this to that. So, and I just, I do love um, that you bring you you bring it all together because that's where I very rarely find that there's a straight and narrow way to get where you want to be. Yeah. Some people are lucky, and I kind of use the word lucky because sometimes if they, if it comes too easily, then mm -hmm. when they have a midlife crisis and go, sure. oh, what am I what am I doing here? But so, <laughs> and I think that to some degree, um, living or working for a, an organization for a long time, well, for me at least, the benefit was that it brought me some stability because, again, I, I had said at the very beginning, you know, how family was really important to me. And being a mom and factoring that into it, and then being a wife, factoring that into it, it, it definitely provided me, um, like I said, an experience that I was able to take advantage of. and and some security and stability. Um, I understand why people leave and change organizations and it's not, from my perspective, it's not looked at frowned upon. That was just my my journey that, you know, that I had to, to do. So kind of tied into that is, so what makes a great educator? So what, when you look to hire educators, what do you look for? Because it, you know, because there is stability in that job, but there's also, you know, there's lots of changes that happen. So kind of, sure. you know, reframe it to when you look out, what do you, because especially you are an educator. So, and then you hire educators. Sure. So, um, I think that there's a number of things that that we look at as an employer um, or a number of things that I would look at as an employer. Um, definitely experiences, which you just spoke to, um, 
career switchers, um, job related experience to education is what we look for. Um, I personally spend time a lot on the activity skills and credentials area. Um, endorsements can be very intriguing. And for those of you who don't know, an endorsement area is an area that you would identify to teach. You would be eligible to teach. You would receive a licensure to teach. Um, there are some hard to fill areas than others, um, but I do, I do pay particular interest in that. And then um, I also pay in uh, particular interest and in, in, um, focus on the activity section, because I think the activity section can lend to an understanding of one's interests, their pride, and their passion towards specific um, interest groups or bodies of work. Um, and so I think that it's important that you are able to kind of create as much of a holistic picture of a person in the, in the form of a candidate. Um, as an employer, we're really limited about what we have access to. Um, but I would say those things. And then I would also say more importantly, and this probably goes at the top, any type of experience that is expressed in the form of a resume or a cover letter or a job or an interview um, that takes a look at why you have an interest to work with children, okay? So we're just gonna talk about children in general for the K-12 population, that's really important. It is our job in human resources to identify role models for our children. So I'm like a lioness, I'm very protective about children. And it is my responsibility to ensure or at least practice that the people that we're gonna be coming in are safe and they're loving and they're caring. And that really can't be, um, always detected or always gathered, you know, in the employment process, but as much as possible, it's very, very much important. Um, you know, not everyone who's going into education likes children. Not everyone in education likes people. Um, and so this is, this should not be the profession that you choose as the backup or just because you can. Um, but I would sincerely and genuinely, um, recommend that if you are interested in education that you know you have a passion and a love for people because it's going to be indicative of the results that you're ultimately going to be producing and you also want to have a positive impact on people it is a human services career after all just you know like nursing that's where i oftentimes see you know when students come in to say hey i'm thinking about and they'll say nursing and i'm like so you like people and if they hesitate i'm like you sure. know then i was like and, and you like bodily fluids or you can't no or you can deal with them and then <laughs> if i see them cringe on that one i'm like you can learn how to deal with the bodily fluids but it's a little bit harder to learn how to like people if, if that's not something there from the get-go um so, yeah, so it sounds like like personality makes you know personality impacts that you know energy you know so you're kind yeah. of at the whole big picture um of the person to be hired into a career that's helping other people um so what what when somebody's just starting out what can they do to you know start getting experiences that make them attractive to you as a hiring force? Sure. Um, I think one of the questions that you had presented to me was um, the idea of, of internships, um, externships, or volunteering. Um, I think that those are great ways to introduce yourself, not only to a, a potential employer, but also a career or even a profession. Um, oftentimes, it even solidifies um, an interest in work in that actual profession itself. And sometimes it uh, gives you some experience to make other career choices as well, like going independent and working for your own and creating your own businesses. Um, I think that those should always be an option as well. But um, ways to kind of get some experience and gain experience would be, would be those things exactly. Um, opportunities where you can just work with a population of people. Like if you can work with children, um, it might not necessarily be as a teacher, but it might be as an instructional assistant. 
Um, we have um, custodians, we have bus drivers, we have um, a number of different other roles that um, have a direct impact on children um, if you care to explore what the education field is like. So, so, so substitute teachers, a lot of times I would say to students who are kind of thinking, what is the um, hiring criteria? Because that can be a very flexible way to get some money coming in. So can, can you talk about the substitute, hire, a substitute teacher hiring process? Sure. Um, a, the substitute teaching hiring process, there's no um, experience that's required, um, mm -hmm. but we do um, try to focus on individuals who at least have some type of college experience because ultimately you would be conveying content to students. And so your knowledge about math, science, um, the arts, uh, whatever you're going to be teaching is going to be important. And so I would encourage um, the building of content and building of skill in that way. Um, you would simply apply um, and be considered. You would be screened just as any other applicant would be. Again, we really are looking for people who have um, some skills and some experiences ultimately to, to be able to introduce them to our students. Um, because it's a temporary basis, you know. So um, uh, individuals who have relation, uh, who have relationships, um, or who have building relationship skills, might be, you know, um, something that you could bring to the table too. If you don't have that that type of uh, experience already. Well, we have our first chat question, and so hey. what about? And it's a great one. What about a bachelor's versus a master's degree? Um, I'm thinking about obtaining my BSCD at UVA with an add-on endorsement of ESOL, um, or maybe ESL during my master's, yet I would love to go back and obtain my master's while I work. I feel like that will give me more experience as a teacher while I further my education. Sure. So I hope I'm going to hit um, all of the points and answer your question with this and that. Once you actually have the bachelor's degree and certification, um, in my professional opinion, okay, um, it's not a matter of the degrees that you get as much as it is the learning and the um, experiences that you get. Now, there are some jobs that are going to require a graduate degree, um, but to, to get, and, and those are more administrative, uh, but to get into actual teaching profession, you could in fact go ahead and get the bachelor's and the certification. And then if you're interested in adding other endorsement areas, again, that teaching focus area, uh, school counselors also hold them, speech language pathologists, physical therapists, school social workers, they also fit in that realm as well. That, those are considered endorsements. You would simply take the practices too to add on an additional endorsement, okay? Um, so to the person who just asked the question, if it's a matter of, um, of you trying to apply for something specific, then I would recommend that you go ahead and, and get the master's degree, especially if it's a leadership role. But otherwise, again, if you wanna explore and just try um, other endorsement areas and things, then um, you could obtain that without getting the graduate degree. Um, I don't think that one's looked at more than the other per se. Um, I will say that we just so happen to live in a highly educated community where I, I, we have been ranked in the top 25% um, for highest education level attainment in the country. So are, there are a lot of credential people in our, in our area. That's a great question because I actually, when I was at Curry, I'd have some people go, well, should I do the master's degree, the five-year BAMT um, program, you know, and I was like, well, you're getting a master's degree with one extra year. There is a salary difference for people that have a master's degree in the public school world, private school world, maybe, maybe not, kind of somewhat depends. Like, I think your, your, your reference to geographic region is critical because that's where I was be like, where do you want to teach? Because I had heard the rumor that up in Maine, they can't afford to teach. They can't afford to pay master's degree teachers as much so that you've actually not overqualified yourself, but over salaried yourself, um, depending on 
who all who all is it buying for jobs and what their budgets involve. Um, and not every school division has education as a factor of um, as a factor of compensation. So it, it might not necessarily matter in, in that regard. But I think lifelong learning is important. However you do it, you know, you need to decide whether or not um, the extra degrees mean something to you or if that's what you want to do. But um, I, I truly believe that lifelong learning can come in all different types of forms. And it was interesting when I was at Curry that the amount of students who got their teacher's certification, but then they came back to the education, UBA's education school for school counseling uh, master's degree because they had they really enjoyed the classroom, but they were then ready for more of a one on one individualized type of assistance that school counselors can do. And actually, at some at one point in the hiring history of school counselors, if you didn't have classroom experience, you were really at a disadvantage for uh, competing for school counseling jobs. Now that has changed in this current uh, uh, environment in Virginia in particular, but there are still some states I think out there that still require you know, classroom teaching experience before they'll hire you on as a school counselor. But then if you're kind of going, hey, I'm not 100% sure which master's degree I want, I think meets the suggestion of, hey, get the bachelor's degree, get the certification, get the job, and then you know figure out which area. Because that's where some people say, hey, I'm really ready to go into leadership. So my master's degree would be administration, you know, rather than putting that master's degree money into a licensure area, a teaching licensure area. So great suggestions. Okay, so anyway, um, Talk, do you all guys, do you all use LinkedIn for your hiring? Um, I have, I'm seeing more and more mm -hmm. uh, types of positions show up on LinkedIn, you know, and, or, or do you, are, are, is there a particular platform that you would suggest to, to students to, you know, utilize in their job search? Sure. So interestingly enough, I personally have only been utilizing LinkedIn for about two years now, um, even as a paid LinkedIn um, member. Uh, professionally, I use LinkedIn to post jobs um, and for my own personal learning, because I think that you can gather a lot more than just a job announcement from LinkedIn. You can also get a great deal of information around professional learning trends, um, things that are just going on in your profession, um, things that are going on with your colleagues, um, all different types of opportunities. So that's what um, LinkedIn is used personally and professionally. Um, I do like to use other social media platforms and I would recommend that um, for the job search process that you would consider those things as well. Um, I do use um, Instagram, I, I am on Twitter. I do not use Facebook. Um, the organization or my division um, has Facebook has Facebook pages, but um, I personally don't have not used them. Um, but I would suggest that the individuals go to the individual school sites, um, whether that be a private school or a division site, and also the state to which you are applying, um, that State Department of Education that has oftentimes a wealth of information that can also be used um, and uh, better understanding of what positions that are actually out there as well. Um, some other things to consider would be educational professional associations. There's always a professional association associated with every single content area and every body of people that are interested in education. So I would go to those. And then the other piece that I would use would be, um, uh, we have a teacher's union, the National Education Association. Um, not only do we have it on the national level, but we also have local chapters as well. And so um, for your area, for your region, I would actually turn to, to them too. So the, a word that everybody cringes about is that networking word that kind of LinkedIn facilitates. But I oftentimes would have students say, I really want to substitute teach, or I really want to work at this school, or I really want this particular county. How, how do, you know, and, and so I, and, and they would say, how do I network with them? And so 
I know when I put together the Educators Expo, you guys came out in force um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to recruit at that event. And it was a great way for students to easily meet hiring folks in person. So now COVID, of course, has impacted that. Mm -hmm. So in this day and age, how, how do you suggest educators network to better make, to better make themselves known as being interested in a particular kind of school or district? I would focus on those sites and places that are presenting that type of information, putting that on. I mean, we really are relying on networking. Uh, or we are really relying on technology so much and especially in these COVID times. And so what has happened is networking is now, it's, just, it's still happening, but it's just in the form of technology. So participating in webinars and participating in online classes and um, reaching out to individual people within the organization um, and also just communicating, whether that be in the form of an email or a post on a social media site or something like that. Um, that's what I would recommend that, that you do to just kind of keep the networking going. I'd also take advantage of the time that um, this is for, for many of you, uh, because there's not as much social engagement and interaction going on, you need to kind of really think about um, what's important to you and how you network and how you are taking advantage of your time um, and doing so, and then also building skill and capacity. Back in the day um, when Gigi and I were first starting, networking was, it was all about it. I mean, it was, what is this thing? It's not a matter of what you know, who you know. Um, I still think that that's important, but I very much value skill and um, abilities. And so, you know, take advantage of this time and, and do a lot of that and then make connections to people through those skills that you have. Well, it was funny because uh, we had, we did a slogan at UVA was that was networking is better than not working, and um, no doubt we got a we got a bit of uh, that's so negative. negative. <laughs> so, but at the talk about COVID because how do you impact this? You know, what what are you guys thinking? Think's going to happen for recruiting for next to 2021, 2022? school year, are there gonna be instructional assistant positions? Are there gonna, you know, um, do you think it's, it's everything's gonna be back in the classroom? So I think every school division right now is just trying to figure it out because no one's ever gone through a pandemic before. But our first priority is really the safety for um, our students and safety for our staff that's serving our students. Um, and that's every single role that could possibly be in a school or school building or an organization. So we're keeping it moving. Um, uh, online learning and, and virtual learning has definitely impacted the career field um, tremendously. But I'm looking at it um, not so negatively. I'm looking at it as though this gives us an, an opportunity to reimagine what education is like. Um, and what it can do and what it can be. I think that um, we will not stop hiring uh, because we will always have students. That's the awesome thing. You know, we'll always have students to serve and we'll always have different types of students to serve. What COVID has done or this virtual learning experience has done is that it's giving us um, a dose of reality that students and families are struggling and that we need to, again, reimagine what it is that we need to do to serve those families. So some students are thriving in this environment. They absolutely love virtual learning. They just can't get enough. Some, like my youngest child, who is very much a social being and creature, this is, this, this is the worst thing ever. Now, he loves being online, but you know, you don't get to be with your friends and you don't get to be with, you know, your classmates and things of that nature. And so we're just really taking advantage of that. On this back end, I think what we'll find is um, school will never look the same way, likely. 
And, um, you know, this is exciting. You know, um, we have unfortunately some, some negative things that have, um, that we've faced in the education world um, is that school bullying incidences, they have decreased. That's the awesome part. Um, but there's been an increase in the reporting of child abuse and neglect cases. So that leads us to really, again, reimagine what we're doing and how we're serving families and how we're, stu how we're also serving um, students. And more importantly, and above all of this, as I had shared before, safety is just so important. And unfortunately, we have lost people from them. So. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's been a very interesting and I and it, finding the silver lining in all of it is 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 it's, it's, it's critical, but it's also difficult. But so but we gotta keep you know, it moving, and that's what we're doing. We are keeping right. it moving, and we're keeping the momentum going. Right. So that's what. It, so what classes do you suggest to students who are at the community college level to take who are considering this education as a career? What, what would you say? Hey, this will help you. Sure. Get I think it really all depends on your inner interests and what you ultimately want to focus on. I think that the classes that are offered and um, at PVCC in particular. Um, you have things where if you wanted to discover like a general interest. Um, or a general idea of what exists. There's uh, a class called Introduction to uh, the Teaching Profession. I think that that would kind of give you some idea of what's going on in schools. Um, another general kind of perspective that you can take is if you were to take classes in the social sciences areas to include anthropology, psychology, sociology, where you're studying people you're start studying learning styles, you're studying living styles um, as well. I think that uh, technology is always great to learn if you're not already, if it's not already intuitively coming to you and you need to formalize it in the form of a technology piece, then I think you need to look at that. Um, we do uh, find in education that because students are thriving, um, in the virtual world that likely will be continuing to teach in the virtual world too, especially if it's going to set students up for success. Some other things that come to mind are art classes. Art classes will help inspire creativity in you if you need some of that. Um, uh, and then um, I was going to say that when you are in classes, if you find a class that you've chosen and you don't really like it, I think that those are really helpful as well because they can help you um, figure out maybe what are some weak areas as far as your competency, but then also the fact that you just don't like that and you might want to go in another direction. Yeah, that's that's where our general studies uh, degree used to require public speaking, and I'd have students go. <gasps> public speaking. I was like, well, it's a great skill to have no matter what career field you go into. But if you're going into teaching, you do have to get up and speak to people. So you it do. You do. And whether that's going to be in the virtual world or, you know, physically face to face with students. Yep. Yep. So there is a bit of stress in this field. I know we're getting close on wrapping up our time. So if people have questions, throw them in the chat box. Uh, that how, how do you feel educators handle the stress that's involved in this career field? Or, how, or do you have any suggestions for? Sure. I think um, self-care is extremely important, regardless of your career, your profession. Um, this, could, this impacts every single industry. So in our organization in particular, one of the things that we've done is we're providing professional learning on self-care. Um, we put out a um, monthly or bi-monthly newsletter uh, around wellness and um, wellness information. Um, and um, wellness can come in a number of different forms we're finding for self-care. That would be physical wellness, mental health care, financial wellness. Um, you know, we're getting hit in so many different ways with this, with this pandemic and it's causing a great deal of stress. Um, so we're we're acknowledging that and then we're providing 
Um, we also provide professional learning around safety, um, which is really important. COVID safety, COVID-19 safety, how to engage with students, how to interact with students, how to physically be in spaces um, where there are other people, um, how to clean. Um, some other things is uh, we've also upped our game with mentoring because every person has different types of issues and we're all needing to be mentored in different ways. And so that's also important. And then um, we try to, as much as we can keep our uh, staff abreast of the community services that are available to everyone because maybe there might not be something that we can necessarily provide in Charlottesville City Schools or in the organization but maybe the community might be doing something. There's a lot of partnering that's going on. And that's the kind of the cool thing about um, us addressing stress, stressors um, as a community. Um, and so that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I would recommend that, we, that you do, and then also um, um, things to just kind of consider to continue to take care of yourself. Those are great suggestions. Now I'm going to kind of do a door urge sure. and nuts and bolts. Uh, so one or two page resume, cover letter, what, what, because you alluded to quite a bit about the resume saying, hey, sure. Sure. I'm, I'm about quality over quantity. And I'm about ensuring that the most important information. So in the English language, we read from top to top to bottom, left to right, right? If you're going ab abroad or you um, are pursuing an interest or career in, in another space or place, learn about what's most important in those places and spaces, okay? Um, but here in the States, we read top to bottom, left to right, so the most important information at the top and on the left, okay? If you are going with um, regardless of whatever number of pages you choose to use, make sure your information is, again, top to bottom. There's not a lot of space that that is left. You, you can utilize that space to share who you are. Um, and if you end up going to two pages, making sure that the first page is just as strong as the second page. And your contact information is on both pages. So just in case something gets lost, right? You get lost. <laughs> And I only come up with one page. I still have everything, so I can um, turn to that. So that that's that's going to be really important. Again, it's quality over quantity. Make sure you get your resume reviewed. Um, other people have other perspectives, and what you need to do is decide what is working. The resume is oftentimes the thing that's going to get you in the door for the interview. The interview is oftentimes that piece that's going to um, get you the job. Um, but if I may, um, Gigi, I just wanted to share one piece, and that's, and that's going back to what we had talked about before about these platforms that we're using. Social media platforms, um, once you make an, a print, a footprint in social media and electronic platforms, um, they're there to stay. And so I would strongly encourage some attention to be drawn to how you are presenting yourself in terms of social media. Um, again, it is our responsibility as, as educators to ensure that we have the most positive, um, safe people that we can in front of our students. And so just know you, you might wanna Google yourself. How many of you have Googled yourselves out there? Raise your hand. Judy, Judy, is anyone raising their hand? Is anyone yeah. Google? Yeah, them? I see. Oh, I see it. At least two raised hands. All right. So you need to Google yourself, and you know, need to know what your electronic footprint looks like, um, because it's searchable. And as an employer, you know, we do have, you know, technology is available to us. And so, if you're not, if you're not googling uh, a candidate, uh, a parent will. A parent will. They, they, we, we do. We Google <laughs> and we search. We want to know about who's going to be with our children. So Google yourself and ensure that you have a positive outlook. Um, there you go. I see someone who just. I'm not allowed to see the person, but welcome to the person who just texted. Yes, we do. Um, 
uh, and so um, yeah, just make sure you 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 check on that and you you look at yourself and continue to have a positive input. Well, and part of that is your are your references too, because that's the thing is you guys consider who people list as their references, and that's one something I see at the community college level that they forget that their teachers can be a good reference for them. Um, and that's that's where I, I I find that that's sometimes that they feel like oh I don't have anybody who can be a reference for me I've just worked at Hardee's or McDonald's and it's like no no you can use references if you're involved with your church do you mind I know we're running low on time but this is such great information so yeah um, so references I would get people who can honestly speak to your skill set and abilities your personality, what you can bring to the table. What I would do first though, is ensure with that individual who you ask, one, that you have permission to use them as a reference, but two, you might wanna even ask the question, even if there's a little bit of doubt, can you positively submit a reference for me um, or serve as a rec uh, uh, serve as a reference for me uh, uh, or make that recommendation for me in a positive way? because sometimes you might utilize someone's name or, um, and, and the person either doesn't really know a lot about you, they can't speak to your skill set or abilities, or they might even have something um, probably more negative to say to not work to your advantage. Yeah, and then actually we had a wonderful um, addition to uh, your comment about the social platforms is uh, she wrote add check privacy settings to your pl platforms. I agree parents and children see the platforms I have heard we saw your picture. And so I thank you so much for adding that because that's where it is very important to check your your privacy. So settings. any of your so what I'm hearing is any of the personal pages that you have established for yourself just make sure that they're private and people can't get in and out of them. Exactly. So I know we're running out of time, but so knowing what you know today, mm -hmm. the seasoned professional that you, you are, what would you tell yourself to do when you were a student? I really, really thought about this, Gigi, and to those that are out there. And it, this was an awesome time for me to reflect. And I had already shared this with Gigi before, but um, I would definitely spend time learning about how to learn and to knowing about myself like really staying in to in touch and in tune with myself i think that i was just such a busy body before that i didn't really think about what i wanted and what i desired i was just producing 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 and just having a lot of fun while doing it but not necessarily thinking about what makes me tick and what makes me happy and bring joy and all of those things um I would tell myself that there's no one way to pursue a career or your dreams and that there's so many different ways to reaching goals. I would learn to be a generalist and not a specialist and I'd be really confident in the transferable skills that I've acquired because they can ultimately go to other professions. So don't limit yourself because you're already going to have people who are going to limit you anyway. Um, so I would suggest that. I would also tell myself to be sure to help define what it means to be professional. You guys are gonna be working out there and you're gonna have people judging you and looking at your credentials and deciding who's going to be brought on board and who's not. Um, define who you are as a professional and just keep in mind that everyone didn't get the same life memo. So um, find a place that's going to take care of you um, when, you're, when you're working. Um, I would ensure work-life balance I would tell myself that definitely. And then I would tell myself, and this wasn't a term that I knew before, but adulting would be a good thing to learn and practice. Um, again, everyone didn't get the same life memo. So learn as much as you can. I would do things like avoid debt if I could help it. I, I did, you know, I didn't really pay attention, a lot of attention to that. Um, and that cooking, was going to be so valuable in my life, not only as an interest, but also again, as a skill. Um, and last and in conclusion, 49 years later, I'm absolutely still doing what I love. I'm loving on my family. I'm definitely providing a service to my community and I'm dancing, privately that is.
<laughs> this was just so phenomenal. You actually I had a little goosebumps Aww. on that answer. So I was just like, oh, because I love it when people are t articulate these ideas so beautifully that you know and that's why i think you know it, it's so hard when you're young to kind of figure out what's external influence on you and what's internal that you need for yourself and and that's that i i think you did just a beautiful job articulating that so thank you so much so any i i'm gonna let if anybody has any more questions throw them in the chat box soon um, any final thoughts? Because I, I know I, I didn't mean to box you in with cer certain questions, yeah. but because I think you had a nice t talk. You, you mentioned intersectionality um, when we were talking, and I, I do love that word, but I don't want to lead you in that, a certain direction yeah. either. <laughs> well, I think it's important to know yourself, and I think it it's important for you to um, know the parts of yourself that make you who you are. Um, build that confidence, you know, that's something that no one can take away from you. You know, you're building skill, no one can ever take that away from you. It's, it's, it's so important, I think, just with journeys of life, um, because all of us are going to be facing something different. So in that world of intersectionality, I would encourage you to know the parts of yourself. Thank you. So that's beautiful. And we're at the top of the hour. So um, I hear my British is breaking out. <laughs> I really should have. I, I'd love to be able to travel more <laughs> and yes. to the day that we can do that again. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you all to, that came and participated today. I, this will be recorded and then put on our YouTube uh, channel in case you want to share it with um, friends and um, family. Um, I do think that this actually has many more broader implications than just uh, aspiring educators, <laughs> considering all those nuggets of wisdom you shared. So thank you so, so much. And um, I hope to see you at Bodo soon, or maybe not. We'll just get a cup of coffee. Yeah, we might be outside. But um, to everyone out there, um, the best of luck to each and every one of you. Continued success to you. Um, keep on keeping on. And if I can help in any way to facilitate anything for you, um, my contact information is already on the post for this um, presentation. And I'd be happy to um, address any questions that anyone might, might, might have. If you were to just reach out to Charlottesville City Schools Human Resources Department, um, I'm the only Mitsuko in the department. So a pleasure. Great. They're having a, a, an unusual name. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to stop the recording now. All right. <laughs>